She's called a mega ship, a giant vacuum cleaner, the mightiest dredger on Earth. How do you feel if Superman was next to you? It's very big. Christabel Colon. She's brand new. A supersized superstar able to build ports, harbors, canals, even islands. So projects become feasible, which in the, in the past could not have been done. And in the frigid waters of the North Sea, she will face her very first test, building her first mega project. Christobel Colon is the world's first super dredger. At 223 meters and 78,000 tons, she's a giant. Ah, you have a lot of, a lot of power, a lot of big muscle. It's unbelievable. And today, unbelievable is in big demand. New port construction projects are now supersized, and Christabel was built to take on the monster jobs no other dredger could handle. She's on her way to her very first job in Cuxhaven, Germany, at the mouth of the Elbe River. The Elbe is one of Europe's busiest commercial waterways, and Cuxhaven wants to expand to become a superport. Christabel's job is to create the land the new port will be built on by dumping two and a half million cubic meters of sand on the coast, enough to build the Great Pyramid of Cheops. The deadline is brutal, and so is the weather. Port construction starts in just eight weeks, and Christabel is sailing into one of Germany's worst winters in a hundred years. But before she gets to Cuxhaven, she has to pick up her first load. Cristobal will suck up sand from the seabed in a dredging zone 10 kilometers offshore and then deliver it to Cuxhaven. To get the job done, she'll have to dredge and deliver 85 loads. Her weapons, two long suction pipes and two giant drag heads. Weighing in at 80 tons apiece, each head can vacuum up 20,000 tons of sand an hour and feed it up to the hopper that can hold 46,000 cubic meters, enough to bury a football field nine meters deep. For Captain Jean Bleu, Cristobal Colon's size and strength are made to measure for Cuxhaven. The deal to use this vessel on this project is that we can bring uh, much more than another vessel in one, in one trip. But bigger isn't always better. First officer Patrick Struve is navigating giant Cristobal in one of the busiest shipping lanes in Europe. Every year, 6,000 vessels head in and out of the Elba River. It's like steering an aircraft carrier through rush hour traffic on a long weekend. I have to look at the radar now how far the ships are and how quickly they're coming. Seven ships are on his radar right now, some just a few hundred meters away. One of them cuts across Cristobal's bow with almost no warning. Patrick adjusts his speed, but stays on course. You're not allowed to make a mistake, that's it. If I make a mistake now, we have a collision. But Christabel Cologne is more than just big. She's smart, real smart. Despite her massive size, Captain Bleu runs his super dredger with just 17 crew. He needs only two men on the bridge, which is crammed with enough electronics to keep an astronaut happy. We have uh, a good access to all the information from uh, the engine rooms, from the uh, dredging equipment. 
5,000 sensors control 6,000 valves and feed a steady stream of information to help navigate, dredge, even run the engines. Christabel is the most technically advanced dredger ever built. This is the big deal, yeah. 6 stories below the bridge in the engine room's high-tech control center, chief engineer Danny Huskins runs his entire engine room with just 3 crew. That means the behavior of the engines, temperatures, pressures, all the alarms. We can start and stop the engines from here. We can open valves from here. For example, we get An alarm warns the engineers to check one of Cristobal's two huge diesel engines, the biggest ever installed on a dredger. Together, they pump out 56,000 horsepower, enough energy to light a city, drive the ship, and power every gauge, valve, and sensor on board. This time, there's nothing wrong but Danny can't afford to ignore any one of the hundreds of alarms that go off every day. I think this is the heart of the ship. Eh? When we are not there, you have no power, you have nothing. Back up on the bridge, the ship's computer-controlled dynamic positioning system that maintains their course and heading confirms that Christabel has entered the dredging zone. The site is three kilometers long, barely a hundred meters wide, and right in the middle of the shipping lanes. As Patrick navigates into the zone, two more tankers pass within meters of Christabel. on it, always thinking, and uh, yeah, keep your mind on it. On the other side of the bridge, that's as big as a basketball yeah, court, great. pipe operator uh, Sebastian Scholten brings Cristobal's two drag heads to life. From his command console, he can operate these giant vacuum cleaners by remote control. No start, eh? I was up start, yeah. His shipmates call him Baz, and the dragheads are his babies. Each one weighs as much as a house, but he treats them like fine china. One mistake could send them crashing to the deck or into the side of the ship. I have to take care that I damage nothing with the pipes. So just make sure everything will go okay and smoothly. Everything is in place for their first dredge, but as Boz starts to lower the drag heads, Captain Bleu watches the weather. There's a winter storm building in the North Sea that could shut Cristobal down. Mega dredger Cristobal Colon is 10 kilometers offshore Cuxhaven, Germany in the North Sea. And first officer Patrick Struve is preparing the ship to dredge up her first load of sand. Maximal power stot erop. Yeah, alles draait, eh? If all goes well, in just three hours, she will have 60,000 tons in her belly. But there's a winter storm building, and pipe operator Bas Schulten has no time to waste. To dredge up sand from the seabed, Boz uses Christabel's two huge 80-ton drag heads. He has to move them slowly and carefully as he lowers them over the side. Patrick's job is to navigate Christabel, and he must carefully steer the ship over the dredge site. As Christabel hits her first mark, Boz maneuvers the drag heads into position. Slowly, he lowers them to the bottom, just 15 meters below the keel. Showtime. The drag heads 50T rip into the seabed, loosening the sand. 
At the top of each arm, a powerful 400-ton pump inhales the sand up and into the hopper at 18 kilometers an hour. With every cubic meter of sand, Christabel also vacuums up a cubic meter of water. It's the only way to suck up so much sand so fast. But as soon as he uses the water, Baz needs to lose it. We don't want water, we want sand. So all the water go out and we take more sand. As the sand enters the hopper, it sinks to the bottom. A giant funnel is then lowered, skimming off the excess water and draining it back into the sea. Filling the hopper is a delicate operation. A carefully choreographed dance between navigator and pipe operator. Together, Patrick and Boz have just one job. Keep the drag heads on the seabed. Using real-time data from sensors right on the drag heads, Boz raises and lowers the heads constantly as he follows the contours of the bottom. While Patrick battles swells and currents to maintain the ship's position inside the dredging zone. We're going to 13 meters off, Bas. 13.50, you. Yeah, we communicate very good eh? for long distance, but uh, when it's quiet, we can hear each other. Speed is critical. Dredge sand up too fast or too slow, and the pipes could clog, shutting Christopher down. We have to take care that we not block any pipes and keep the speed and going. And this is the main thing that we do. But midway through the dredge, Patrick has a problem. If you look to the buoy now, you see how much current there is. There is now between the four and the five knots currents ahead of me. The fast sea current could knock Cristobal off course, and any sudden movement could smash the drag heads against the ship. Yes, especially now, and the current, the, the pipe will go constantly under the ship, so I keep it very close to the bottom, but not too much, otherwise it will go. As Patrick nears the end of the dredging zone, his sensors warn him that Cristobal is drifting. All the time here, lichten. A little bit Yeah. You take yourself the jet pump naar beneden. Ja, tuurlijk. I stow maximal power. Tak niet meer me. Baz struggles to keep the drag heads away from the ship, while Patrick fights the fast currents with his thrusters. Propellers mounted on the hull that can maneuver the ship sideways. He has to apply power carefully. Too much, and he'll push Christabel out of the narrow dredging zone and into the busy shipping lanes. So what I go do, I go a little bit more to the center, and then I go swing them around at one time. Bow thrusters, turn thrusters. And it works. Christabel comes back on course and stays there. It's so far so good. But as tons of sand pour into the hopper, suddenly there's another problem. Cold winter weather has knocked out a key sensor. This one measures how much sand is in the hopper. It's also frozen, I think. So Baz and Patrick continue filling Christabel the old-fashioned way by eye. On the beach, what you see on the beach when you see the waves coming up, goes smooth, smooth, slowly, and I want to see the same in the hopper. And I know he's almost full. Getting it right is critical. Fill Christabel too full and she could run aground. You, you touch the bottom and then it's finished. With sand pouring into the hopper at 18 kilometers an hour, Christabel dredges her first load right on schedule. 30,000 cubic meters of sand, enough to fill 1,630 dump trucks. Despite the frozen sensor, it goes off without a hitch. 
Phase one is complete, and Boz hauls in the drag heads. Yeah, good afternoon, sir. Around uh, four to five minutes to uh, 50 minutes, we are on the connection. Now, Cristobal is in a race with the weather. A winter storm is right in her face, and high winds are pushing a large ice flow toward her. It won't take long for it to sweep down the Elba River and block their path. It's Captain Blue's worst nightmare. He has to beat the ice to Cuxhaven and orders Patrick to get there fast. Yes, hello, as soon as Christabel arrives at the new port, a fleet of tugs rush out to meet her. They've got a tricky job. Guide the dredger into shallow water just offshore so she can discharge her load. On shore, Project manager Kobe Pears watches Christabel arrive. He's worried. There's less than three meters of water under her keel. One small error and she could run aground. This vessel is 223 meters long. So it's, if something happens, it's only seconds before the dredger is washed ashore. So Kobe waits and watches Christabel and the tugs get to work. To help fight the powerful six-knot river current, one tug connects to Christabel's stern, the other to her bow. The other way that I go or stop turning it. With a delicate touch on his thrusters, Patrick carefully spins the ship while the tugs struggle to hold her in position. Now, Christabel must stay exactly where she is. Captain Bleu orders the anchor to be dropped. The orders let go. Let go. Like everything else on Christabel, it's huge. 16 tons. Captain Bleu orders out enough chain to lock his ship in position. But anchoring is the easy part. They've now got to discharge 60,000 tons of sand, and they've got to do it fast. The ice is coming. If they don't unload before it hits, port construction could shut down. Cristobal Colon is in a race against time. Ice from upriver is approaching fast, and Captain Bleu doesn't have a moment to lose. He and his first officer, Patrick Struve, have to unload 60,000 tons of sand before the ice shuts them down. To do that, they have to connect to a discharge pipe that runs from the new port side down to the shoreline. From there, it disappears underwater. 140 meters offshore, it surfaces, attached to a float that has to be hauled over and connected to a discharge valve on Christabel's bow. And that's the job of the tug, Bremerhaven. Bremerhaven, the Christopher Colomb. You can bring the line. OK, Christopher Colomb. Thank you. I'm underway with the line. Thank you. Klaus Dumla is the Bremerhaven's captain. He's been driving tugs for over 40 years. Using his powerful twin diesel engines, he slowly tows the 188-ton pipe toward the ship. Like a lasso, Cristobal's deck crew lowers Klaus a line. 
so the tug's crew can connect it to the discharge pipe. But just as Cristobal starts hauling it up, the ice arrives. The current is moving so fast, in seconds, it pushes the discharge pipe away from the ship. Patrick watches from the bridge and orders Klaus to drive it back. Okay, uh, you bring me up, go push the pipeline, you can stay also stand by, because there is a lot of ice coming on the tide. But Bremerhaven's big twin diesels, powerful enough to push an aircraft carrier around, can't beat the ice. Normally the current alone is okay, and ice alone is also okay, but ice and current together, I think it's too hard. With the current, Pushing the ice faster than he ever thought possible, Patrick calls in reinforcements. In a desperate bid to get the discharge pipe connected, Patrick orders all three tugs to drive it toward the ship. On Bremerhaven, Klaus kicks his 2,000 horsepower diesels into high gear. It's now a battle between the tugs and an ice flow a kilometer long. Slowly they push the discharge pipe forward, but the tugs combined might still can't get it close to Cristobal. By nightfall, it's still not connected. A job that usually takes 20 minutes is now in its fourth hour. On Cristobal's bridge, the night shift takes over. First officer, Leon Idema, replaces Patrick. But all he can do is watch the tugs continue to fight the ice. Finally, after eight hours of non-stop heaving, Klaus and the other tugs beat the ice. It's just before dawn when they position the discharge pipe right under Cristobal's bow. Okay, Cristobal, go along. The line is connect. You can heave. Thank you for connecting and uh, we'll start heaving. Okay, fine. On board, the deck crew slowly haul it up. The discharge pipe is in place. And Cristobal is ready to deliver. To discharge the sand, high pressure jets blast 30,000 cubic meters of water back into the hopper. When the mixture turns to liquid mud, pipes on the bottom of the hopper open up and it's pumped into the discharge pipe with enough force to send it seven kilometers. Thank you, this listening. Uh, water is coming. It's 6 a.m. when Cristobal starts to deliver her first load. Just two hours later, She's pumped over 80,000 tons of sand and water onto the new port site. In 17 years, project manager Koba Piers has never seen anything like it. This, this, this amount of sand is, uh, is 
arrival before. We never had it, had it before. A fleet of dozers and excavators swing into action. The pressure is on. Cristobal is spewing out enough sand to bury Wembley Stadium nine meters deep. How do you feel if Superman was next to you? I don't know, he's very big. Kevin Demmerman is Kobe's site foreman. The ice has put Christabel and construction behind schedule, and he can't afford another setback. I don't want uh, any delay. I don't want to delay the ship. If I delay, we have big problems. Kevin's not the only one feeling the heat. Dozer operator Wolfgang Friends is rushing to keep up with Christabel. In 30 years, he's never seen so much sand. So I come up and go to the big it's also dangerous work. The discharged mud is like quicksand. Without water, it's easy to work with a bulldozer. With water, it's very difficult. They don't see anything, huh? They have to work on feeling, huh? But they're not keeping up. Cristobal is discharging five tons of sand a second. It's piling up so fast around the end of the pipe, it could clog it. So Kobe orders Kevin to add another section of pipe and divert the mud to a new part of the site. It's a challenge because you cannot distribute the sand 600 meters away without extending the pipeline during the pumping. The flow of water which comes out of the pipeline should never, ever stop. Kevin directs the excavator into position. With sand blasting out at the speed of a subway train, he guides the 10-ton pipe in. With another section in place, the discharge continues without losing a beat. Ah, uh, the little stress we have, huh? The little stress. Back on Christabel, the crew keeps a close eye on the two huge discharge pumps as they finish disgorging their first load. Two stories tall and able to empty an Olympic-sized pool in two minutes, they've disgorged 60,000 tons of sand in three hours. With the hopper close to empty, tugs maneuver into position to recover the discharge pipe. On the bridge, Patrick gives the order to disconnect. Cristobal's first discharge is complete. But there's still no time to waste Captain Bleu immediately heads back to the dredge site. He should have discharged three loads by now, but he's delivered just one, and he's feeling the pressure. Because this is, in fact, my, uh, my deal on board, They're keeping me running seven days a week and uh, all the years long. That's it. That's what I'm paid for. But with the ship underway, an alarm goes off in the control room. A valve has ruptured in the pump room. Christabel has another big problem. After discharging her first load of sand in Cuxhaven, Germany, Christabel Cologne is heading back to the dredge site in the North Sea. But eight stories below the bridge, a valve has ruptured in the pump room. It's a huge problem. This is a big valve with a very big job. It controls the flow of sand from the hopper. No valve means that Christabel's ability to discharge sand is crippled. It costs nearly $10,000 for every hour Christabel is out of action. Captain Bleu comes down to inspect the damage himself and then orders all hands on deck. 
Even Baz is drafted from the bridge. The repair crew quickly lower the damaged five-ton valve. On the pump room floor, technical superintendent Francisco Perez y Diego assesses the damage. Like Captain Bleu, he's worried by what he sees. Only, uh, now we're looking for the damage on the uh, broken uh, valve gate, and it looks quite bad, actually. The hopper's monster pumps are to blame. During the discharge of so much sand, the pressure ripped the valve open like a wet paper bag. The damage is so bad, the valve can't be repaired. It must be replaced. We replace the, the broken valve casing by the new one, which we have on board. It's a massive job, and no one knows how long it will take. And that's another big problem for Captain Blue. In just five hours, Christabel will be back in Caxhaven, ready to discharge her next load. Francisco has to move fast. If he can't replace the valve in time, Christabel will fall even further behind schedule. Up on the bridge, Captain Bleu sets a course for the dredge site, and the countdown begins. While Francisco's crew start tearing out the broken valve, the day shift finally takes a break. And Cristobal is the place to do it. The ship was custom made to help her crew blow off steam. There's a bar, a gym, satellite TV, and one of the best chefs money can buy. They are uh, six weeks from home, so we must feed them, eh? Give them the cares they need. Lorenzo de Smith knows it's been a frustrating day for the crew. In the galley, he prepares another gourmet meal for both shifts. But Lorenzo sees himself as more than just a cook. Yeah, always plenty job on the ship, huh? Taking care of all these guys. Uh, uh, sometimes they say the cook is the mama, but... <laughs> yeah, taking care like a mama at home for the kids, huh? <laughs> but down below, Francisco and his team have no time for a good meal. They're pulling a double shift in a desperate bid to replace the damaged valve. A repair crew is busy connecting the hydraulics that open and close the new valve. But it's slow work. The valve is the size of a Volkswagen, and the parts are huge. Meanwhile, Christabel has arrived back at the dredge site, just as winter sea conditions start to turn nasty. But as Christabel's second dredge begins, Captain Bleu isn't worried about the weather. He's worried about his valve and heads below for an update. Francisco and his team are still struggling to connect the hydraulics. They're still hours away from replacing the valve. On the bridge, First Officer Leon Idema carefully navigates Christabel over the dredge site. Even at night, the Elba River is still as busy as a freeway, and it's now almost impossible to see another ship coming. Leon has to keep a close eye on his radar as the hopper fills up with sand. But Francisco is running out of time. It will be like a challenge, so uh, let's see that. On deck, the dredge is on schedule, and the hopper is filling quickly. 
In less than three hours, Christabel gobbles up 35,000 cubic meters of sand. As morning arrives, the drag heads are hauled in and Christabel sets course for Cuxhaven. In just 45 minutes, the ship will be back at the discharge site. But Captain Blue still has no word that the new valve is ready to go. And no idea if Christabel will be ready to unload. Christabel Colon is back at the new port site in Cuxhaven, but she can't unload. In the pump room, Francisco Perez y Diego and his team are rushing to replace the five-ton valve, and they're running out of time. Beside Cristobal, the tugs take a line from the dredger. This time, the ice is holding off as the tugs push the discharge pipe toward the ship. The connection begins. And down in the pump room, they've done it. The new valve is installed. With just minutes to spare, Francisco and his team have made the deadline. Cristobal is now ready to discharge her next load. But now there's a new problem. Christabel's pumps are running at full power, but on shore, nothing is being discharged. No water, and worse, no sand. Back on Christabel, Chief Engineer Danny Hueskins quickly tests his systems. Everything checks out. Up on the bridge, Vaz checks his sensors too, looking for a blockage in the hopper or pumps. Nothing. The problem is not on Cristobal. On shore, the pipe is checked for clogs. Again, nothing. Cristobal is out of action. It's now up to Operation Superintendent Joris Sandermans to troubleshoot the problem on land. But Joris suspects it's more than that. He wants to know if there's a break in the submerged section of the discharge pipe and has come up with an ingenious plan to use Cristobal's big pumps. We're going to start pumping water from the ship side and to see if we can notice a leak somewhere. Joris thinks ice flows and strong currents caused the problem. When the ice pushed hard against the discharge pipe, it bent and then cracked. If he's right, water pump from Cristobal will bubble out of the leak and mark the spot. The, the, uh, the water right in front of the Annika on the starboard side, you can see the water coming up. Yes, it's I confirmed it the discharge pipe is broken. And until it's repaired, Cristobal is down for the count again. Captain Bleu fears the worst. <laughs> to fix the pipe, Joris has to first haul it out of the river. He commandeers the workboat MCS Annika for the job. 
The Anarchist captain, Francis Matthews, hooks a sling to the boat's powerful working crane and straps it around the discharge pipe. Okay, man. Try and lift it with the second ram first. But he can't budge the damaged pipe. The crane's good for 28 ton. It's not lifting it. The repair mission is getting dangerous. Francis is stretching his cables to the breaking point. No one knows how much the discharge pipe weighs. If it's more than 50 tons, the winch cable could snap. Finally, they wrestle the pipe onto the deck. Yeah. Uh, lifted the hose nearly over the bollard there, so then we can pull it on deck, and then it, we, we have a lot of less weight on it. Sure enough, the rest of the discharge pipe slides in. Twelve hours after they began, Joris gets a look at the damage. But the, the rupture was on a weld, so yeah, there might have been a, a defect somewhere in the weld and that caused it to break off. It's a clean break, but a dirty job to fix it. The construction site roars back to life. As Cristobal spews out 35,000 tons of sand. And the land for the new port begins to rise again. Her schedule is shattered, but Cristobal Colon is back in action. To get back on track, Captain Jean Bleu will have to push his crew and his ship as hard as he can. It takes two or three or four voyages a day. That's the, um, the calculation, the production, and uh, to be competitive. We must work together. If you don't work together, you don't have results. We have to keep on pumping. Keep Just keep on pumping. As soon as Cristobal arrives back at the dredge site, the drag heads are lowered. The race is on. It's a little bit adrenaline. It's going to be fun. <laughs> With the winter weather cooperating, Cristobal makes a dozen perfect runs and delivers 600,000 tons of sand. For the first time since the job began, both Captain Bleu and Coba Pears believe their deadline is within reach. Thanks to the Cristobal Colomb, the size of her size and her capacities, we can still finish this project on time. I think that's a good chance that we will uh, we'll make it. Over the next few weeks, Cristobal makes more than 70 runs and delivers 2 million cubic meters of sand. It's more than enough to finish the project right on schedule. And I must say, I'm, I'm absolutely amazed about the capacities and I'm, I'm absolutely surprised about what's, what this vessel is capable of doing. But to Kobe, Cristobal's success is about more than just hitting a deadline. It's a new beginning. And I think the Cristobal Colón will mark the start of a new era in the dredging industry. During one of the worst winters in a century, Cristobal Colón battled time and the elements and won. And along the way, she proved that bigger is better.
She's called a mega ship, a giant vacuum cleaner, the mightiest dredger on Earth. How do you feel if Superman was next to you? It's very big. Christabel Colon. She's brand new. A supersized superstar able to build ports, harbors, canals, even islands. So projects become feasible, which in the, in the past could not have been done. And in the frigid waters of the North Sea, she will face her very first test, building her first mega project. Christobel Colon is the world's first super dredger. At 223 meters and 78,000 tons, she's a giant. Ah, you have a lot of, a lot of power, a lot of big muscle. It's unbelievable. And today, unbelievable is in big demand. New port construction projects are now supersized, and Christabel was built to take on the monster jobs no other dredger could handle. She's on her way to her very first job in Cuxhaven, Germany, at the mouth of the Elbe River. The Elbe is one of Europe's busiest commercial waterways, and Cuxhaven wants to expand to become a superport. Christabel's job is to create the land the new port will be built on by dumping two and a half million cubic meters of sand on the coast, enough to build the Great Pyramid of Cheops. The deadline is brutal, and so is the weather. Port construction starts in just eight weeks, and Christabel is sailing into one of Germany's worst winters in a hundred years. She's called a megaship, a giant vacuum cleaner, the mightiest dredger on Earth. How do you feel if Superman was next to you? It's very big. Christabel Colon. She's brand new. A supersized superstar able to build ports, harbors, canals, even islands. So projects become feasible, which in the, in the past could not have been done. And in the frigid waters of the North Sea, she will face her very first test building her first mega project. Christobel Colon is the world's first super dredger. At 223 meters and 78,000 tons, she's a giant. Ah, you have a lot of, a lot of power, a lot of big muscle. It's unbelievable. And today, unbelievable is in big demand. New port construction projects are now supersized, and Christabel was built to take on the monster jobs no other dredger could handle. She's on her way to her very first job in Cuxhaven, Germany, at the mouth of the Elbe River. The Elbe is one of Europe's busiest commercial waterways, and Cuxhaven wants to expand to become a superport. Christabel's job is to create the land the new port will be built on by dumping two and a half million cubic meters of sand on the coast, enough to build the Great Pyramid of Cheops. The deadline is brutal, and so is the weather. Port construction starts in just eight weeks, and Christabel is sailing into one of Germany's worst winters in a hundred years. But before she gets to Cuxhaven, she has to pick up her first load.